Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to, uh, to Matrix. This is the first of our semester's uh, book discussions. Uh, before I s introduce our speakers today, I just want to flag a couple of things that are coming up. We have a number of them. Uh, we have uh, Brandy Summers, who will be here uh, talking in conversation with uh, Nikki Jones about Brandy's new book, um, Black in Place, Spatial Aesthetics uh, of Race in a Post-Chocolate City. We'll be having uh, Steve Weber, political science, who has a new book out, Block by Block, which is discussing global capitalism and global firms. Uh, he'll be in discussion with uh, Homer Barami at Business School and uh, Vinny Agarwal, political science. We have uh, Rosemary Joyce, anthropologist, who'll be talking about her new book, The Future of Nuclear Waste, with Catherine Carson uh, and Kate O'Neill. And last but not least, we'll have um, Laura Perez, who will be talking about Eros Ideologies, her new book, Writings on Art, Spirituality, and the Decolonial. All of those things are coming up. In addition, we have our lunchtime sort of brown bag discussions on topics of political interest. We had, for those of you who came, a fantastic discussion uh, on impeachment uh, last semester with Bob Reich and uh, Erwin Chemerinsky. It was terrific. Uh, and we'll even more depressing discussion on Brexit. Uh, and we have coming up this semester, uh, beginning next week, um, a discussion on the fate of the forests. We have another event in March on electoral manipulation. We have something on taxation and the 1%. And then we have, to wrap it up, something on Bay Area homelessness. So all of that stuff is coming up. Um, so let me turn to, uh, to the introductions here. I'm going to be fantastically brief because you don't want to be listening to me. Uh, w I could speak at length about all of the people sitting up front here, um, but I'm going to try to be brief so that we can get to uh, discussion. Uh, so let me introduce firstly the uh, author uh, of today's book, uh, uh, Stephanie, uh, Stephanie Jones Rogers, uh, will be here discussing her book. Uh, they were her property, White Women as Slave Owners in the American South. Uh, Stephanie uh, received her PhD at Rutgers. She's a historian of American slavery, a historian of women and gender history. Uh, before coming here, uh, she was at the University of Iowa, and prior to that, uh, at Tulane. Uh, she, this book has been widely lauded, as, as you all know, but she has a couple of other projects that she's working on. Uh, one on the impact of uh, West African customary law on matrilineal descent, uh, English matrilineal descent, and how that was or was not imported to the colonies, North America in particular. And for me, a fantastically interesting project on women and young girls who uh, were part of or attended the operations of the Royal Afri Africa Company on the West African coast and who spent parts, important parts of their lives in the castles and factories uh, in the 18th century and before. Uh, Stephanie, we're deeply uh, grateful for her to be here. Uh, when I invited Stephanie, she did say that author meets critics sounds a bit like an inquisition. Uh, it's, it's, I'm sorry, it's not meant to be that way. It's meant to be like what my mother would have called an opportunity to natter. So this is an opportunity to natter. Um, our interlocutors today, uh, Leslie Salzinger, uh, sociologist, um, but has been teaching here for some time in the Gender and Women's Studies program. She also has affiliations with sociology and the designated emphasis in critical theory. She's an ethnographer, trained here, but before coming here, she was at Chicago and Boston. Uh, her book, a foundational book really, Genders in Production, was a study, ethnographic study of the shop floor and social life uh, in the Maquila factories on the border. She's continuing her work in, uh, on, uh, with respect to um, Mexico and, and particularly a new project on the relationships between neoliberalism and masculinity. Brian Wagner uh, is uh, in the English department. Um, has many interests uh, in vernacular culture and the law, but has spent um, a fair amount of time of his own uh, working on questions of slavery. Uh, he has a, a number of books speaking to this issue. Um, Tar Baby is one that you've perhaps uh, heard of or read. Uh, again, enormously influential. Um, and uh, he's going to be talking from the vantage point of his own as it were, cultural work uh, in and around slavery and post-slavery in the US. Um, that's the uh, format, or that's the, those are the speakers. The format, I uh, usually ask uh, the author to speak for about 15 minutes or so, to speak whatever they want to, and then the interlocutors for about 10 or 15, 
Then, if this is okay with everyone, we typically open it up. I'll take two or three questions. I'll toss them back to the speakers, and they can improvise in whatever way they wish. We'll probably have a, uh, a time for a couple of rounds, and then I'll offer Stephanie the opportunity to make some summary remarks if she, if she wishes. So uh, thank you all, and thank you, Stephanie, in particular. And so let me give the floor over to you so that you can begin. So thank you so much, Michael, for that wonderful introduction. I want to also thank Jessica for organizing everything and making everything flow smoothly. Um, and also, thank you all for coming this afternoon. I know you have so many things you can do with your time. And I'm very appreciative of the fact that you've come and shared some of your time. You've chosen to share some of your time with me today. So um, this book is um, derived from my dissertation, my doctoral dissertation. And um, as a graduate student, um, as I was preparing for you know, my examinations, um, I was um, reading and very immersed, very much immersed in the scholarship um, written about white Southern women and their relationships to enslaved people, but also as a person trained um, in African American history as my primary field, I was also reading um, the scholarship about um, enslaved and formerly enslaved people in the South during the same period of time, during the 19th century. And so during that, that preparation, I was really astonished to, to see what I thought was a disconnect between those two subfields of history, wherein um, those who focused on the lives of white Southern women um, often argued that white women, particularly married white women, didn't have a direct economic investment in the institution of slavery. But on the other hand, um, those who focused on the lives of enslaved people, the lives of formerly enslaved people, said something quite different, said that when you look at what formerly enslaved people had to say about these women that were in their lives, that not only did many of these women own them, but these women had deep and profound economic investments in their continued subjugation and enslavement and bondage. And so I was really interested in trying to understand that disconnect and trying to get at the question of, whether enslaved people were right, whether these white women, married women in particular, had a deep economic investment in the institution of slavery, and if so, how did that look? So I used formerly enslaved people as my guide. I started with their um, reflections, their accounts, their testimony, and, and, and proceeded from there. So the book is a culmination of all of that. Um, the dissertation was, and then the book um, is a culmination of all of that. So um, what's really interesting is that, that historians of um, white Southern women um, continue to embrace a view that was propagated by James Redpath, this lovely gentleman you see here. Um, he was a journalist and editor of New York Tribune. Um, he was author, also the author of a book called The Roving Editor, um, or Talks with Slaves in Southern States. And so in 1859, after touring the antebellum South, Redpath attempted to explain for his readers why white Southern women opposed emancipation. He believed that their sentiments were tied to a lifetime of indoctrination, reared as they were under the shadow of the peculiar institution. Slavery was incessantly praised and defended, he argued, virtually everywhere they went, by everyone they knew, and in most of the publications they read. Their consciences, he said, thus easily perverted, end quote, were never afterwards appealed to, with the result that they saw no reason to change their views. Redpath assumed that white Southern women did not know, quote, Negro slavery as it is, end quote, because their society shielded them from the institution's horrific realities. Insulated by Southern patriarchs, white women seldom saw slavery's, quote, most obnoxious features, end quote, they never, quote, ever attended auctions, never witnessed examinations of enslaved people, and seldom, if ever, see the Negroes lashed, end quote. More profoundly, Redpath argued that they did not know that the, quote, interstate trade in slaves was a, quote, gigantic commerce. Southern men revealed only the South, the South side view of slavery, and if the women of the South, quote, knew slavery as it is, quote, end quote, rather, <laughs> he was convinced that they would join in the protests against it. Redpath's assumptions represented a commonly held patriarchal view, and as I said in the beginning, um, one that continues to pervade the scholarship about Southern women's economic relationships to slavery, or the lack thereof. But this, of course, is not how enslaved people and formerly enslaved people remembered things at all. They and others, as well as an array of narrative sources, legal and financial documents, military 
and government correspondence make it clear that white Southern women and girls knew the most obnoxious features of slavery all too well. Slave owning women and girls not only witnessed the most brutal, brutal features of slavery, they took part in them, they profited from them, and they defended them. And I wanted to offer a few examples during my time with you today. So I know that you probably cannot see the text here, but I will be helping out with that. <laughs> this is one example of one of the thousands of interviews, um, transcribed interviews, that the federal government conducted with formerly enslaved people who were still alive in the 1930s and 1940s. And this happens to be um, the account um, that documents Millie Simpkins' interview um, and her experiences in slavery. So when I looked at these kinds of documents, what I was immediately struck by was just how much information um, enslaved people and formerly enslaved people provided about the women who indeed owned them, um, who they identified as their legal owners. So for Millie Simpkins, here her account not only tells us the name of her mistress as well as her master, but also tells us the name and the free, the names and the free and bound conditions of her parents. Um, the socioeconomic status of her mistress, um, details about her sale, and what's really important is that um, what, she, what she argues is not that her master sold her, um, but that her mistress sold her, and her mistress didn't sell her because she needed the money, she didn't sell her because she was in debt, she didn't sell her because she wasn't able to perform the kind of labor that she wanted her to perform. She sold her because she was stubborn, and she sold her away from her husband when she did so. Um, in addition to that, she tells us the location of the slave market where she was sold. So she tells us she was sold in the Nashville um, slave market, which at this time was the second, the, the third largest, and the second, lar the third largest in the country, slave market in the country, and the third largest um, in the South. Um, New Orleans being the first largest, and <coughs> Memphis, Tennessee being the second largest. And then she tells us about her experience, um, what happened to her, and what happened to other enslaved people in the slave market, so in the slave yard where enslaved people were housed. But using these small fragments um, in um, people, in, in slave, formerly enslaved people's testimony like Millie Simpkins, I was able to trace um, de these details and find um, fragments that connected um, to these, um, these, I I these ideas, these thoughts, these um, details about these women in other um, forms, in other archives. So here are just some beautiful pictures of um, Millie Simpkins' mistress. So the mistress that she identifies. She also told us how many times her mistress was married. So her mistress was married three times. And so here you can see her many uh, surnames. Uh, she was Sarah Ann Ewing Sims Carter Galb. Um, she was wealthy. Um, and that's one, um, one um, distinction that I want to point out. Um, in the book, I don't focus primarily on wealthy women. I focus on the average, um, typical slaveholding woman. So this would not be a woman like Sarah Sims, um, who owned multiple, many dozens of enslaved people, would rather those, those slave-owning women who owned less than 20, um, typically less than 10 or 5. Um, but this is just an example of how I was able to use the interviews, the, these, um, the testimonies and interviews done with formerly enslaved people to track these women down and to find um, richer details about their lives and about their economic investments in the institution of slavery. And here I was able to find Sarah Ann Sims, who was at this time Sarah Ann Ewing, um, in the census. Um, and not only that, it shows that it corroborates additional details that Millie Simpkins provides in her testimony. So it tells us that yes, at this time she was a widow because she is identified as the primary household, um, the member head of household, um, because she's listed here without a male, um, a male above her. So she's the primary um, head of house. She's the head of household here. It also shows that she has several children with her former husband's last name, so that are named Sims. Um, some that are named um, after her previous, um, her most recent but recently deceased husband, Carter. Um, and so it also um, corroborates a really, another really important detail that Millie Simpkins gives us, and that is that her mistress was quite wealthy. So if you look to the right-hand side near the red bracket, you can see that it enumerates, um, it, it estimates the value of her real estate and her personal estate. And that real estate and personal estate combined would have a total purchasing power of close to $800,000 today. 
So this is a very wealthy woman. And while she's exceptional because I don't focus on these particular kinds of women in the book, um, I nevertheless was able to kind of show how Millie Simpkins really was on her stuff. <laughs> she really knew what she was talking about. And so what this also underscores is the fact that the federal government recognized these women as legal title holders to property, but in this particular case, to enslaved people. Here's yet another example of a, a slave-owning woman who appears in the 1850s census. In this particular case, in 1850, the federal government decided it might be a good idea for us to figure out just how many enslaved people exist in the country. So they started to enumerate individuals' slave holdings. Now, as you can see from this page, there aren't any details um, except for age and race um, or color of um, the enslaved people that are enumerated there. But it does identify the person who identifies themselves as the legal title holder of those enslaved people. And in this particular case, that's the person who identified themselves as the slave holder of these 14 enslaved people is Mrs. Sarah M. Rhodes. Formerly enslaved people also tell us about the most intimate dimensions of life within slaveholding households. Those kinds of intimate details that would not make it into, may not make it into um, diaries or letters or personal correspondence. And in this particular case, Rachel Sullivan, this excerpt from Rachel Sullivan's interview, um, drives home the fact that enslaved women were used by some white mothers um, as wet nurses to feed their children, to nurture their children. So she tells us that she served as what was called a dry nurse, which is simply a person who cares for an infant. But she says that she was called to, to, to task, to do that task, because her aunt was then asked to or compelled to serve as the wet nurse for a guest in her mister, mistress's and master's home. Um, she also perhaps over exaggerates here. Um, she also argues that all white women had wet nurses in this, in this era. But what it draws attention to is the fact that there's a kind of labor, a kind of very intimate labor that often doesn't, that often escapes um, public notice, um, in large part because it remains within the household. But what I did with this little detail was looked for other references to the use of enslaved wet nurses. And what I was astonished to find is that Southern newspapers carried advertisements that not only um, made it clear that there was a market for enslaved wet nurses' labor, but also that people were trying to supply the enslaved wet nurses that would fulfill the demands that white mothers were, um, were placing on the market itself. So here are three, just three examples of the kinds of um, um, ads for wet nurses that I found in Southern newspapers. So the first on the top um, was an advertisement placed by a very um, well-known and profit-seeking, um, profit of course, wealthy um, slave trader in New Orleans, J.W. Bozeman. He makes it clear that he is selling a, an enslaved wet nurse who's 19 years old with her second child. And notice he doesn't mention the first child. So we don't know if she lost that first child because it died or because she was sold away from that infant or child. Um, in addition to that, on the right-hand side is another advertisement for the sale of, of a Negro um, wench or wet nurse in this particular case. She, too, has a child. And if you notice on the, the second or the third and fourth red line, he mentions that she frequently served in this capacity. So it, in, it indicates that there is a possibility that um, the demand for wet nurses and the use of wet nurses was far more um, common than many historians of Southern motherhood and Southern women have argued in the past. But looking at and listening very closely to what formerly enslaved people had to say about this practice led me beyond the household and into the market. Um, and there's yet another one where um, it shows that this individual is seeking um, an enslaved wet nurse to either purchase or to hire. And this woman, Mary Kinchian Edwards, was a formerly enslaved woman who, during her interview um, with the federal government, argued that the primary form of labor that she performed during slavery happened to be wet nursing. So this was her primary um, charge to wet nurse her um, mistresses and mis master's um, children. 
And this very blurry um, image um, also drives home the point that these kinds of market transactions didn't stay or remain within the intimate and informal market of the household and local communities. Um, it also tied um, women to the formal slave market, the brick and mortar slave market. This is an account, a page from the account book of a very famous um, slave trader, John White, who operated in New Orleans as well as in St. Louis, Missouri. And the red lines un underscore the um, transactions that, were pro that, that um, took place between him and one woman, just one woman alone, Mrs. M.R. Johnson. In addition to that, just like we receive a receipt today when we purchase anything, or for most of the things that we purchase today, we receive a receipt, um, this is the kind of document um, which would operate or function very much like a receipt in the 19th century called the Bill of Sale. And after each transaction of um, when an enslaved, enslaved person was purchased or sold, um, the, the buyer would receive a Bill of Sale. And this particular Bill of Sale documents the transaction that took place between Elizabeth Morrison um, for an enslaved woman named Susan. And she too went to a slave trader to sell Susan. She sold her for $410, which has the purchasing power today of over $13,000. And I think one of the things that was most astonishing to me, particularly because the scholarship around white Southern women and their, um, their inability to own property in most cases was this idea, I found, I discovered that the federal law, um, the federal government recognized their ownership of, of enslaved people, but so did state laws. So did um, local um, municipal entities. And this is just one example of the ways in which Southern laws recognized in the text that women owned enslaved people and also that they were gonna be held accountable for the conduct of those enslaved people, not their husbands, not their overseers, but the women. So in each of those red highlighted areas is a reference to a mistress, a reference to her property or her plantation, et cetera. So there are ways in which not simply people in these women's communities are recognizing their property ownership, their slave ownership, and their legal title and deep investments in the economy of American slavery, but also these other entities beyond their households, beyond their communities. And when um, local, local communities um, needed enslaved people to perform public works, um, they would call upon local slave owners, in this particular case, Eliza Farrell, to perform that labor. In this particular case, um, this is a receipt that documents the wages that Eliza Farrell received for the enslaved woman Rose that she owned for the labor that she performed for the city of New Orleans. And deep into the Civil War, um, quite deep into the Civil War, um, we find yet more evidence, um, well I found, <laughs> yet more evidence of the deep and profound investments that white women and girls continue to have in enslaved people and that they held on as tightly as they could to the enslaved, prop the enslaved people that they claimed as their property. When the, federal, when the Confederacy um, wanted to build fortifications or they wanted to, um, to have trenches dug, um, they would call upon local slaveholders to, um, bring, to, to provide those laborers. And women were not um, immune or exempt from these impressment um, pro um, processes. So this is a page from a payroll book um, that the Confederates um, kept or maintained to ensure that all of the enslaved people who worked on those fortifications and um, did public work um, during the Civil War for the Confederates would receive the wages that those enslaved people earned because of that labor. And so, as you can see with the red dots, each of those red dots represents a slave-owning woman or girl that received wages for an enslaved person's labor on Confederate um, fortifications um, and labor um, more broadly or work more broadly in their efforts to try to win the war. And finally, up to the very last days. <laughs> so the surrender was in April. <laughs> Hattie McKee is trying to hunt down 
um, this um, enslaved man, Edward, Edward Pickett. And what's ironic is that my, grand, my late grandfather's name was Edward Pickett, so um, when I saw this, I was a little taken aback. Um, but nevertheless, she is in Louisiana in 1865 in February, only months before the surrender, still trying to seek help in her community to hunt down and to recapture um, an enslaved man. And as you can see in the red, um, the, the part that's underlined in red, she identifies this individual, not as her husband's um, slave, not as her son's slave or her father's slave, but as her slave. Um, so by, by foregrounding the testimony of formerly enslaved people um, and using what they had to say as my cue to look elsewhere, to dig elsewhere, to delve more deeply in other archival, um, archival um, <coughs> collections, I was able to craft what I thought was a really extraordinary story about the average slave-owning woman's deep economic investments in the institution of slavery and, their and the continued subjugation of African Americans even after slavery was over. And with that, I will end. I thank you so much for your time and attention, and I look forward to hearing what Leslie and Brian have to say. Hey, everybody. So it's really such a pleasure to be here. It's, it's just such a great opportunity to actually spend time with your book. I so appreciated it. I mean, not that it was fun exactly. <laughs> um, so anyhow, I'll, I'm just I'm going to mostly read just because otherwise I'm going to go over time and I want to leave time for us all to talk. So I wanted to start by saying that They Were Her Property is really an extraordinary book. It is not for the faint of heart. There are many descriptions that are really excruciating. but. The descriptions are not gratuitous. They have work to do, and Jones Rogers uses these descriptions to illuminate not just an important part of our history, but how we think more generally about gender and power and the meaning of femininity, about dichotomies of public and private, and about, di and about how labor is carried about, how reproductive labor is carried out under distinctive iterations of um, capitalism. I'm going to go through each of these briefly in turn, try and do something sort of more schematic that will give us another way of entering the book. And it, I think a lot of what I say is very, is going to repeat what you said, but hopefully in a slightly different form. So. Um, I just want to say first that part of what makes this account possible is its sources. And I think using the accounts given to the Federal Writers Project by enslaved people themselves gave you access to the, the institution that really is, you really couldn't have gotten any other way. And it makes it very moving, but also you just get a really specific and important view of what's going on. And one thing I would love to hear from you, actually, that you don't do in the book exactly, is what, what other, like sort of a list of the other things you used, because you talk much more about this as your source, but obviously you used many sources. Um, but that aside. Um, and the, another thing that I loved about that, them as a source is I really appreciated your um, quoting the, the people's words exactly and phonetically as they were written, not like trying to make them sound more the way people would be speaking now. And I thought there was something about that that was very respectful. And uh, anyhow, so I thought it was fascinating. Um, but in any case, that does give you the ability to really see this institution from a particular vantage point and from the vantage point of people who had a huge investment in understanding how it worked. And so you get this incredibly detailed view, which I think is just very important. So that said, I want to start first by talking about the way this helps us really rethink um, some of the ways people talk about femininity, and particularly the way um, historically many feminist theorists have talked about um, slave societies and the position of, of women within them. So there's a, a really a long history, some of which you talk about in your book, of looking at slave society the American, in the American South and talking about white women as being really out of the game too feminine to be fully involved in the kind of sordid business of buying and selling people, not too sort of delicate to manage enslaved people, certainly much too delicate to physically discipline them. And I think a lot of early feminist theory, there were a variety of accounts suggesting that in a patriarchal world, white men used their relations with slaves to keep white women in line, to put them on pedestals where they would be consigned to a sort of useless, fragile purity. Um, unable to act for themselves, and sort of operating in a field of sexual violence towards African American women that enforced their purity and made white men the sort of dastardly protagonists of the story towards both white women and, um, and, women of, and black women. Jones Rogers really begs to differ. 
She shows how white slave-owning women bought and sold people, <coughs> managed and disciplined them, often with terrible performative violence. She shows these women as calculating actors, taking care to protect their investments in human beings. Any idea that white women were more delicate, more compassionate, disappears in the first pages of the book, as Jones Rogers lays out slave women's training to be mistresses, protection of their investments, involvement in buying and selling, and, and often actions as violent disciplinarians. Part of what's so fascinating here is that she shows slave women as frequently protecting their investments in slaves from their own husbands. And here she's taking direct aim at these earlier claims. Some husbands undoubtedly controlled both their white wives and slaves with an iron fist, but she describes case after case where slave-owning women protected their slaves from the whims, stupidity, and avarice of their husbands who wanted to manage them poorly or sell them off. Even when these women fended off husbands who wanted to protect enslaved people from their mistress's brutality, protecting their own rights as owners to brutally discipline their own slaves. This suggests a world far less simply hierarchical than we've often seen described. Rather than a predictable <coughs> set of power relations flowing from white men down, she describes a more fluid power structure in which slave-owning women acted in their own interest, sometimes against their husband's wishes. In this, Jones Rogers gives us women's agency with a vengeance. If part of a women of feminist project is to show that women too can take and enact power, then we can here truly see the ugly side of that capacity. Women slave owners acted in these accounts with full brutality in ways that in no way match an image of a delicate receding feminine powerlessness. Part of what's so fascinating here is that Jones Rogers suggested in certain ways slave-owning women were more, not less, empowered than women outside of slave-owning societies. And I'd actually love to hear if you think that, if so, but I'll, I'll say a little more of that now. That is, you imply that the fact of owning their own people gave these women a certain sort of autonomy and, um, and independence not generally available to even privileged women in other social contexts. Thus, you suggest in the postbellum period, you actually see slave women oven, owning women fervently and panickedly attempting to protect their property. I'm quite sure that slave owning men were doing the same. But, but the implication here is that for these slave owning women, they were even more intensely freaked out about this because one of the things that having access to, that having control of slaves did for these women was not only give them control over enslaved people, which obviously was true for the men as well, but gave them a kind of secure vantage point from which they could negotiate with their husbands. So that it, it was a very kind of complex way in which this, these women, especially I think the wealthier ones, really had um, more power in their homes, not less, than women maybe in other contexts. One further wrinkle that really struck me as I was reading were the shifting terms of gendered power across natal and marital families. That is, in this account, in wealthier families, I think especially, slave-owning inheritances were often, slave-owning inheritors were left gendered inheritances. Sons were often left land, assuming they'd stay where they were, whereas daughters were frequently left slaves who they could take with them into marriages. In the latter case, Jones Rogers describes the ways that these inheritances were structured to protect daughters' inheritances from potentially spendthrift or unscrupulous husbands. That is, fathers often left daughters enslaved people with the explicit proviso that whatever the doctrine of coverture that said about husbands' right to control their wives' property, that that would be superseded by wills that gave them their own enslaved people and explicitly said that husbands had no right to sell or manage them. This suggests a kind of prioritization of family of origin over family of marriage. And I wondered if in some way the patriarchal power here also worked from fathers to daughters more than from husbands to wives. And I'm just curious. I don't really know anything about this. This isn't any way to question the larger point that slave-owning women's agency is buyers, sellings and buyers, sellers, and discipliners, which is empirically demonstrated, but to wonder how the gendered relations flowed across generations differently than it did within families. Okay, so that's one big part. Um, unsurprisingly, once the book undoes this assumption of feminine innocence and fragility and the institution of slavery, other binaries tend to tumble as well. And one of these is the way we think of public and private, home and market. There's a long history of accounts in which slave-owning women were understood as mistresses at home, but not as buyers and sellers, not as traffickers in human beings. 
This was one more way to protect the image of innocence and separation for white Southern femininity. Jones Rogers conclusively undoes that image empirically, providing multiple instances and examples, as she did today, of slave owning women buying and selling people. But in the process, she also pushes us to see the market itself differently. First, she points out that data sources produced by historians to understand these markets keep track of who was bought and sold in terms of their gender and race, but they actually don't even keep track of who's, who's doing the buying and selling. So there's a certain kind of naturalization of the market, either as kind of a machine where it doesn't matter who does it, or as just presumably masculine. And so there's a certain kind of neutrality that happens there that she's starting to contest right at the outset. But she also starts taking on the question of where the market itself is located. And this you're very explicit about. So we have tons of images and paintings and so on, including actually in the front of the book, of these huge public auctions where men yelled out prices for enslaved people. But she points out that many deals happened outside of the formal market. In fact, the market itself doesn't really only happen in the marketplace. The market happens all over the place. Sometimes this is true because slave traders went around the country and they stopped in people's houses and they were like, do you need an enslaved person? Are you missing somebody? Do you have somebody to sell? So there was a certain kind of itin itinerant quality. There was also, though, the even more intermixed with home life kind of sitting at the kitchen table and two women are talking and somebody is like, I need a wet nurse, you know, well, how, what are you going to do? Well, I might have somebody for you. So these, these disturbingly informal ways in which the market fully interpenetrated with the intimate life of people's daily experiences. That is, once Jones Roberts insists that we see slave-owning slave women as actors, then the putative split between public and private, between market and home, begin to come undone as well. And we see that these realms interpenetrate, so that the full commodification of people saturates life up and down and through, no exemption from the market just because one is in hearth and home. So the last thing I want to say here, which follows, I think, directly from that last one, is that the work also points us to shifts in our understanding of reproductive labor. So there are other wonderful scholars, Cydia Hartman, Jennifer Morgan, who've begun the work of thinking about what it meant for enslaved women to give birth to children who were always already commodities. But here Jones Robert Rogers points us to another aspect of the work of reproduction under the regime of slavery. Throughout the book, she insists that men and women didn't manage in different ways. That is, that we recognize women's mastery or mistressry in all its competence and cruelty and similarity to what men did. However, there are certain moments where that slips. And I, you can see that, I think, particularly, I don't think this is actually a disagreement with you, but I think sometimes, in, in, in some points you're talking about the, the ways they're similar, and in some ways you're talking about the ways they're different. And I think particularly you can see those differences in the realm of reproductive labor. So because of the kind of gendered ordering of white society, of women's ongoing response, of white slave-owning women's ongoing responsibility for reproductive labor in their homes, it did mean that sometimes they managed differently, although certainly not less cruelly. Thus, Jones Rogers describes white women choosing to buy cheap, young African Americans, sometimes taking them for free when their mothers were bought by other buyers uninterested in babies and rearing them for use. And you imply there that they did this more than slave-owning men, so that there was a way in which slave-owning women were willing to do breeding, do rearing, in a way that seemed um, sort of bizarrely and disturbingly related to their function as mothers in other contexts. Um, so that is chilling, and it is very gendered. <laughs> um, another place to see this is obviously in the fascinating and disturbing account of the market in breast milk. Now, as we see it, uh, not as we see it now, where breast milk is sometimes sold as a commodity on its own, but here it is lactating mothers themselves who are sold or who are hired out. I'm actually not going to really talk about this, but I'd love to hear a little more of the, you, you. Just by the way, throughout the book, you show us the, the ways that slaves were also hired labor all the time. So you got that move, so that's very much the case with lactate. I thought that was fascinating. I'd love to hear more about that, but anyhow. Um, but again, this is a part of the market which is dominated by slave owning women who better understood what was needed for infant care and were responsible for doing it. So again, here you see Jones Rogers showing us both slave owning women's distinctiveness within a gendered order, but this distinctive is not about being separate from the regime, not about innocence, but a distinctively gendered arena of buying and selling of reproductive labor. So 
By turning her lens on accounts by formerly enslaved people, Jones Rogers is able to undo a whole set of shibboleths. White women were not innocent bystanders in slavery. Instead, they're active owners protecting their property, traders buying and selling, bosses disciplining. In this, they protected themselves against their husbands when necessary, providing themselves with a certain degree of autonomy not available in the same way to women in other structures. It also undoes the putative split between public and private, between market and hearth, pushing us to understand the interpenetration of seemingly distinct realms. And it shows us some of how reproductive labor can be done in commodified form, revealing how important it is not to assume reproduction as a realm of nature, not worth, worthy of social analysis. I think in recent years, feminist theory and empirical work has been full of calls for less essentialized and more agentic stories about women's lives. And I would say that we really have that here in the most disturbing and powerful way. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, so, uh, Steph, this is such a great book. Um, it, was, it was really powerful and um, it, it, was, it was great to engage. I learned so much from it. It's so convincing and consequential and, and also elegantly written, I have to say. Um, so I'm going to offer just um, a couple um, comments first about its method. Um, and then I have three questions, which we can either like address or leave over there or do whatever we want to do with them. Um, you know, the, the comments about method really um, have to do with the fact that I really feel like this book's power derives from its brass tacks in many ways. Um, you know, how its scope is defined and how its argument is substantiated. You know, if most people previously, as, as Steph was saying a moment ago, um, focused on women who owned many slaves, the wealthiest women, typically who people who would have inherited um, their slaves, um, Steph points out that's a very tiny, um, small, small subset, and it's a poor basis on which to make generalizations. And so unlike those um, previous works, Steph focuses on a very clearly delineated scope, um, which is, you know, um, women who owned fewer than 20, mostly 10, you know, um, slaves in their own right. That last part is also really important because people used to really kind of muddle together people who were women who benefited from slavery or slaves owned by their husbands and, sl and women who own slaves in their own right. There's a kind of clarity there that's brought through that distinction. Um, and just, w I mean, this is a pretty basic point that's active in all, you know, writing of all levels, but, you know, to, to so clearly delineate um, a scope and so powerfully, aggressively follow out its implications. Like, if you can do that well, you know, that's the ball game in some ways. You know, I feel like there's a way in which, for me, this is a kind of exhibit A for graduate students and others about how to um, construct an argument in this case in social history. So that's that's just a very it's it's a kind of basic thing, but it, it for me is um, at the heart of so much. Um, so that's the first comment on method. Second comment though is more about substance and, and evidence, especially this is to build on both your presentation and also what Leslie was um, just saying, um, and especially with your use of the um, the 1930s Federal Writer, Writers Project um, interviews um, these testimonies from ex-slaves, more than 20,000 of them, um, which gives you not only evidence, but also structures the book, right? You know, I mean, like literally you use their words as your chapter titles, right? You know, um, and, um, you know, you really lead, as Leslie was saying, with um, the slaves' point of view. Um, there are obviously um, important precedents um, for this kind of methodological turn, right? You know, away from diaries of elites and actuarial records and such to um, the words um, of, of former slaves, um, going all the way back to, you know, John Blassingame and even like Charles H. Nichols, you know, like way back. Um, but it was also, a, you know, since the 1960s and 1970s when these sources became important to historians, people have also asked a lot of questions about, well, are these reliable sources, right? You know, like the people who were transcribing them, right, were often untrained. They were often racist, right? I mean, so this is the complicated thing about the language, right? You know, the language is, as, as, as you know, as you know, Steph, it's, it's, you know, often an imitation of kind of plantation tradition literature, right? You know, so children, C-H-I-L-L-U-N, we saw in Millie Simpkins, right? But also W-U-Z, right? You know, W-U-Z is not a phonetic spelling, right? You know, like that is actually, you know, if you look up in the dictionary, how do you pronounce W-A-S? It says W-U-Z. Right? There's no phonetic difference between the two. All it marks is the illiteracy 
right? And lack of intelligence of the speaker, right? And so this would be a reason why we might be skeptical, right? You know, of, of these records. Also kind of lapses in memory. These people are talking about things that happened a long time ago. Evasion, they might have distrusted these, these strangers who were coming to interview them. So for a long time, people have asked the question, well, what do we do with these sources? They're kind of corrupted in some ways. And something that, that Steph does that I think is really brilliant is like how you go about the work of corroboration and cross-referencing, right? So this is, it's nice to come up after she was demonstrating this method, right? You know, it's to take, you know, I think you said something like, you know, Millie Simpkins knows her stuff, right? You know, like that. So it's like you can look at, you know, what she says there, but then you can also go to all of this range of other kinds of sources, right? You know, to, um, you know, um, uh, you know, court records, advertisements for runaway slaves, census records, account books, bills of sale, and you can actually see that they know their stuff, right? And so that kind of process of corroboration and cross-referencing and, and elaboration that leads with the slave's point of view, right? But then, you know, develops it through, you know, you know, engagement with a range of sources, I think is really powerful. And I thought it was, I mean, it's nice to just kind of say that because you demonstrated it so, so powerfully um, just a moment ago. So that would be my second point about why I, I feel like methodologically um, this book is um, so sound. Um, so I'll also ask three questions just um, pretty quickly. Um, so, um, so you offer a strong um, critique, um, Leslie was talking about this very well, you know, about um, kind of second wave feminist arguments about the plantation household, right? So Catherine Clinton's The Plantation Mistress of 1982 would be maybe one, you know, kind of primary example um, of, of that work that thinks about um, kinds of the analogy between um, patriarchy and white supremacy, you know, um, alliances suppressed or not between white women and, and the um, enslaved, um, often, as um, you were both saying, minimizing the involvement of white women um, in the institution of slavery, kind of imagining them as, to some degree, insulated or ignorant or, or, or innocent. Um, and so, um, as you also note in the book, you know, that your critique of that line of scholarship, um, you know, um, is anticipated by um, African Americans African-American feminist thinkers going all the way back, you could say, to the early essays of Hazel Carby. For instance, you know, in 1982, you know, like, White Woman Listen is, like, actually the same year you know, as Plantation Mistress. Also, um, you know, Deborah Gray, Gray White, um, Aren't I a Woman? Like, the two versions of it, too, right? Which is, like, interesting, right? Um, and then, you know, in my, I, I, I work on literature, and in my field, it was really the kind of reception and canonization of Harriet Jacobs's Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl became a kind of opportunity for conversation about the limits of alliance, right, you know, and, and um, the kind of problem of the analogy um, that you're really attacking here. Um, also crucial, obvious, is um, the Volia glimpse um, out of the house of bondage of 2008, you know, is also kind of thinking about um, these kinds of issues. So I just wanted to offer, you know, a kind of invitation to, to, to say more um, today about uh, how you build on thinkers like Carby or White or Glimp, um, and also how your work diverges from, from theirs. I think it's, it seems to me like a really important intellectual genealogy um, for um, this project. Um, so that's the first question. Um, so my, my second question um, is, um, asks about the um, uh, implications for our general understanding of coverture from your argument. So this is actually also kind of part of what Leslie was saying about like, well, how distinctive were slave owning women? Did they have more agency? Did they have more investment in property? I'm interested in the distinctiveness of this case, right? Um, how, how it might help us to think about coverture in general, you know, this kind of legal idea of married women not being able to bring suits or make contracts or hold property, right? You know, which relates in a broader sense to our understanding of the separation of spheres of public and private male and female um, in the antebellum decades. Um, so um, one thing that, that Steph shows really powerfully in the book is that if you look to chancery courts and other equity courts as opposed to common law courts, um, we see many, many petitions made by married, married women concerning their property rights in slaves, right? which is, again, contrary to our general understanding of how coverture works, which would say they wouldn't have any property interests in slaves. Um, so again, kind of echoing to, to some degree what Leslie was, was saying, I'm, I'm curious whether you know, to what degree women's assertion of property rights in slaves in the context of these equity courts is anomalous, right? You know, like, is it the case that, you know, this is happening specifically with slavery, or rather is it a kind of representative instance of how antebellum women managed many kinds of property, right? You know, so people like Hendrik Hartog and others, right, have looked to these kinds of courts. And some, you know, some people have concluded, actually, that 
um, you know, coverture is more a legal fiction, right, r r rather than, you know, a kind of um, doctrine. Um, and so I was curious, you know, from you, you, you demonstrate your argument so powerfully in the case of slave only women. I'm, I'm curious um, how, we, how we might think about from that vantage and from the vantage of that basis of evidence, this kind of general question of the legal status of coverture as, as doctrine. Um, so that's my second question. Um, and then my third question is, um, le is not very well formulated. It's more like a kind of provocation. Um, and um, this has to do with like the ways in which this is clearly to me um, a, a, an important contribution. This meaning the book is clearly an important contribution to our kind of current boom time in the literature on slavery and capitalism, right? You know, like this is, it is, we're, we're, there, there, are, there are a lot of these books, you know, but this, this makes an important and distinctive contribution, you know, to that, um, to that conversation um, in, in that it really, really thinks about um, uh, these white women as market actors, right? You know, um, they're, constantly out to maximize their own self-interest. You know, this is one way I think about the interpenetration of public and private that Leslie was talking about. It's almost like everything becomes a manifestation of the market, right? Um, and so, um, you know, um, my, so my question, and my question or just kind of like um, unresolved piece here has to do with other ways in which we might think about women's activity here, you know, uh, cultural ways, psychic ways, somatic ways, you know, em embodied ways, libidinal ways. You know, it seems a lot of the cases that you're talking about, you know, although, as Leslie said, the descriptions are not gratuitous, the violence often feels gratuitous, right? You know, it doesn't feel like it's serving some instrumental purpose, right? It, feels to me like I, I, I find myself reaching for some explanation that would be more psychic, more sexual, kind of, or, or more irrational, right? You know, um, whereas, you know, the, the kind of sense of um, these, these women constantly having a kind of rational understanding of, you know, um, of, of, of what needs to happen in order to maximize her interest. So that was kind of a, a question for me. I felt like in some examples, um, I, found, I found myself thinking about the sadism you were describing you know, and, 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 and reaching for, for other terms to understand the kind of excess um, that, that seemed there, that seemed not entirely explicable in terms of market rationality. Okay, um, but um, so this was, um, this, was, this was so great to, um, to read this book and it's, it's been great to, uh, to hear both of you and I, I look forward to our conversation. Uh, thank you, all three. That was just uh, terrific. Uh, Steph, rather than letting you respond to Brian's question, if you don't mind, I'll take a few more from the floor, and then you can all improvise as you see, as you see fit. I'm going to hand uh, the microphone around because we're recording so that we can hear your questions. So questions, please, sir. So when I was learning about uh, feminism and womanism in seminary, the focus was on the um, sexual jealousy of um, white women in the antebellum South. And um, I'm just curious about this, this mix between the economic motivations of women and the sexual motivations. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation and for the commentary. Uh, my question has to do with kind of notions of family and um, slavery and enslaved status. And I'm wondering if in your research you saw um, any differences between um, the white mistresses and the white masters when it came to questions of property around their own offspring through um, rape and assault of African slaves. So in terms of any variation in um, treatment or willingness to sell them outside of the home or even pass down property to them, if that came up in any of your, of your research, thank you. Third question before I pass back. May I add a question? In relationship to this maybe uh, increased female autonomy uh, wrapped up with investments, for example, 
What does that have to say about conjugality, about the marriage contract? I know nothing about the, the, the history of such things in the, in the, in, in the slave south, but d does that also, in some sense, give reason to rethink what conjugality across classes might actually, quote, look like in its functional, emotional, psychic qualities? I'm going to hand it to you firstly, uh, Steph, and then maybe um, we can, oh, you have, you're good, uh, and then we can have uh, Leslie and, and Brian wait in if, if need be. to me. Um, so let's see. I think I can actually um, get at a couple of the, the, um, the questions um, by, by addressing the issue of coverture, because many of you are probably wondering how this is even possible, um, given what we think we know about the way that um, this institution called coverture or this doctrine called coverture operated in the 19th century. So this, this institution or this legal doctrine of coverture um, basically said that if a woman who owned property or earned wages married, all that property, all those wages immediately became her husband's. Um, and so because of that, many historians um, have long argued that the, the, the doctrine of coverture essentially prevented women from doing the things that they do in this book, um, owning, property, owning enslaved people, inheriting property and, and maintaining control of that property, passing that property on to, um, to, their, uh, to, to heirs and heiresses, um, buying and selling property while married. Um, but what, what I was able to, to, to do by listening to and foregrounding the, the voices and, and testimonies of, of, of formerly enslaved people, um, what I was able to do is to look for evidence to the contrary. <laughs> because formerly enslaved people would say, my mistress was married, um, she owned me and my family, and her husband couldn't do anything with us or couldn't sell us, couldn't beat us. And so I was finding references to um, married women having the kinds of control over property that the legal doctrine of coverture said that they shouldn't have. So I was compelled to look for evidence to corroborate that, um, 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 evidence um, that, as, as Brian's um, comments pointed out, I found in the Chancery Courts. Um, and so what I did find quite astonishing is that um, it seems that the institution of slavery was particularly important um, in these court cases that I found. So the court cases that emerge in um, equity courts, and equity courts are interesting because um, these are courts that operate quite differently from criminal courts or civil courts. Um, you can go into um, a civil court with the same exact um, claim that someone's jeopardizing your, your, um, your property rights or your, your claims to enslave people and lose your case as a married woman, but go into an equity court and provide the same evidence, make the same claims, make the same arguments, um, and, and win a case. And it's, it's quite unusual. I, I, I know for sake of time, I can't go into um, the development of, of, of chance recourse because it starts in England and, and I'll have to then explain how it, how it unfolds here in, in the United States or in um, the New World and I don't have time to do that. But um, equity courts provide women with a very unique opportunity to make certain kinds of claims that they can't make in common law courts. And so they routinely go to those courts. And what, what, I've, what I found in these court cases is that it seems that slavery is the difference um, for why many of these women win their cases. And they win them in the South. And so I'm not the first person to make this argument, but I do build upon the argument. Um, there, has, there have been a number of scholars who have argued that um, if you look at the Married Women's Property Acts, which we typically associate with the North in 1848 and, and thereafter, um, those, those property acts, those married women's property acts start in the South. They actually start in the South. And one of the reasons why many historians who look at those laws argue that they start in the South is because of slavery. Because women, um, they, they need women, they need white women to buy into this system. They need white women to be a part of this system, to be e equally, if not deeply, um, invested in this system. I mean, and, and a way to do that is to ensure that they can also economically benefit from the institution, from the system. And so to do that, they have to also protect their, their rights to property. And so these Married Women Property Act, Married Women's Property Act start in the South in large part because of the institution of slavery. And so these court cases look very unique because they are primarily um, owners of slaves rather than other forms of property. And those claims are primarily because they are, um, the, their, their claims to enslaved people as a very unique 
um, form of, I guess you can say, gender property, as Leslie kind of got at, at her, in, in her in her comments, um, they, they, they know that they, those cases can be one, relatively easy if they have all the evidence necessary to do that, in large part because of the, the importance of the institution of slavery in the South. I, I don't want to go on too, too much longer um, in relationship to that, but coverture um, looks very different because they're able to use legal instruments, legal loopholes to get around the constraints, um, the constraints of coverture, and slavery is very important. Slave ownership is very important to the ways in which they can, they can circumvent um, those constraints. Um, let's see, I'm, I do want to address um, um, the comments about um, notions of family and also um, sexual jealousy, um, which in, 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 in the book, um, it, it manifests as a, as a conversation about sexual violence. So um, I, was, I was very interested in this idea that um, you know, slave-owning women in this book, in, in my work, they do everything that slave-owning men do. But I stopped, seemed to stop short at um, participating in or orchestrating acts of sexual violence. And I wasn't quite sure why I stopped there, but then I, I began to ask that question. You know, if, if slave-owning women can own enslaved people, if they can um, discipline enslaved people, if they can buy and sell enslaved people, were they also um, not simply complicit, not simply um, begrudgingly accepting of sexual violence, but were they also the arbiters of, or did they orchestrate circumstances in which sexual violence could be perpetrated against enslaved people? And when I looked again at what formerly enslaved people had to say, they said yes. So it, it went beyond sexual jealousy. Um, there were some women who um, would sell away enslaved people simply because they assumed that that enslaved person had a child with a, a, a master, a husband. But if that woman owned that person, they seemed to think twice about those, those kinds of sales. There are also instances in which, um, just to get, get at your point um, or your question, there were also instances in which enslaved, enslaved men were coerced or compelled into acts of sexual acts that they, they were not consenting to. And in those cases, if there were mixed race children born of those relationships, white women um, handled those situations quite interestingly because they did technically own those individuals, but those people were free, those in individuals were free. So enslaved, enslaved men who had children with white women those, by law, those children were free, and so they didn't have to, they, they didn't have to sell them away, they couldn't sell them away because they were free, but they could give them away. So what you find is that ensla enslaved men who have children with free white women, um, often because of, of circumstances that were not of their choosing, sometimes those, those mixed race children are given to the enslaved community to raise because it's too much of a taint on the, the white woman in, in, in those cases. There are also instances in which I know this is complicated, but there are also instances in which slave-owning women are related to men who have mixed-race children who are subsequently enslaved, and they step in to, to protect those children. Um, those are rare cases, but you know, because more often they would um, be fine with those individuals being sold away. But in looking at this issue of sexual violence, um, and looking at this issue of family, what I was able to show is that White women are also deeply economically invested in that particular dimension of slavery, um, just as they are in all these other dimensions of slavery. It's, it's, slavery is, a cult, is, is characterized by a culture of violence. Sexual violence is very fundamental to that, to that culture. And they are equally invested in the children that are produced as a consequence of enslaved women's sexual assaults, um, of enslaved men's sexual assault, and of, of the, the sexual assaults that are orchestrated between enslaved people. Um, so th th those are just two really interesting ways that I kind of got at both of those issues in the book. Um, and I'll just, I don't want to monopolize the conversation. Um, but I got, can I just say one thing briefly about, about the last thing that you said, and this also goes back to your last question. So I, I, one of the things I interpreted as your project in the book was to show the way that the economics kind of went all the way down. And maybe in part because of that, you seem more reluctant to do the alternative, which is what people had done in the past, which is to say the kind of libidinal aspects went all the way up, which I think has been, you know, there's been a lot of work that is sort of creepy, some of it, that, t that does that work, but also that must reflect part of what the complexity of that world, the sort of cultural, mm -hmm. the love, the sexual aspects of, and you seem to really pull away from that, and you did just now in your, you know, 
answer as well. So I'm actually not disagreeing, I'm just curious. Like, was that a point you were like, there's enough of that, I'm gonna do a different piece? Do you think that other work is wrong? Like, how do you, what do you think about those connections? Does that? Yeah, I think, I think, um, I mean, I'm a product of my, my society. <laughs> And I think, you know, we're socialized to think about women quite differently when it comes to the perpetration of acts of sexual violence. And so that, that's also the case in the, in the, in the context of, of historic, the historical work here. For me, it was, um, I was pushed, I was encouraged to think about some of these women's acts in, in a sexualized way. And so I, I, I went as far as I think I was comfortable <laughs> doing because there's also a lot of speculation. There's a lot of informed speculation that has to happen around this issue of sexual violence, uh, around the issue of women, um, these women's perhaps sexual desire, the sexual desire that they might, um, you know, um, um, that might arise as a consequence of their viewing of, of naked enslaved people's bodies, you know, things like that. Um, so there's a lot of informed speculation that's that would have to be a part of that broader conversation and. Um, I was only comfortable engaging in just enough <laughs> informed speculation that I could always fall back on my sources, in large part because of a point that Brian made in his comments, which is, you know, this reluctance about the use of um, enslaved people's testimonies, the interviews that I, that I talked about, like Millie Simpkins. They talk about lots of things. Um, they don't talk about them in the ways that we talk about them now, but it takes, it takes a, a, almost a, a, very, a very different kind of um, vernacular. They use a very different vernacular. Um, Brian got at the, the, the issue of the kind of um, the ways in which those interviews are transcribed by the by the writers, by the editors. Um, to um, this was um, this this project was part of a folklore project, um, the uh, Works Progress Administration's folklore um, unit. So there was this this desire to kind of um, to, to harken back to an old time. So there were instances in which they they embellished the language, but what I, I thought was very what was very interesting is that. Um, they would only go but so far. And in those cases, when they talked about sexual violence, sometimes they said, you know, my master was my father, <laughs> you know, but they wouldn't go further than that. So in some cases, I didn't feel comfortable going beyond where they went. Um, and I think some of that reluctance had to do with the fact that I didn't want critics, I didn't want readers to say, but how did you get that out of that? You know, um, I didn't want them to think that it was me necessarily driving the narrative. I wanted the formerly, the formerly enslaved people to drive the narrative, and so they didn't, they didn't feel comfortable in many respects talking about white women in sexualized ways, and so I, I took my cue in some, in some respects from them. Um, I did want to get to Michael's question about um, the ways in which um, slave ownership affected um, the institution of marriage or the ways that marriages um, looked on the ground. What was so astonishing to me was that um, I was able to kind of um, gain a perspective, gain a vantage point of many marriages um, at the average white slave hold, holding um, couples marriage because um, enslaved people happen to be in the room <laughs> and were being ignored and nobody pays attention to them so they just said what they wanted to say, they, you know, um, let loose um, in the presence of enslaved people. And what's, what was really remarkable to me is that these are conversations that would not be in diaries, <laughs> they would not be in letters, um, and so formerly enslaved people's accounts are in, in many cases the only accounts of these kinds of interactions, the dy dy these dynamics within white households that we have. Um, on the only written records that we have. And so what they made clear is that for s many of these slave, slave owning women, um, their slave ownership became a bone of contention in their households, particularly with their husbands. <laughs> so there are instances in which slave owning, um, uh, enslaved people would say that slave owning women would catch their husbands in the process of about, you know, in a process of disciplining a slave that they legally owned. And they would say, mm -mm, mm -mm. stop them right in their tracks, tell them you cannot really lay a hand on my slave, that's my slave, you wanna beat a slave, you beat your own slave. You know, so there were ways in which slave ownership, these women's, you, um, their legal title to enslaved people became a point of conflict for many Sla uh, many slaveholding households, especially when the men themselves didn't own them. Because there are some instances in which slave owning women are the ones bringing the property. They are the property owners, not only the slave owning, the slave owners, but also the land owners. 
And so um, getting at you know, the point that um, Brian very briefly mentioned about slavery and capitalism, you know, I was just kind of reflective about the implications of that. So if we think about capitalism um, and the spread of, of slavery and the, spread and the expansion of slavery into the West, for example, and the expansion um, and the development of capitalism in, in the United States as one that was primarily um, um, are orchestrated by um, men, that, that they were the architects of these two institutions. And we, we reflect upon the fact that there were some instances in which those men had no property. They had no assets, they had no wealth, but they were relying upon the wealth of their wives. They were relying upon the slaves of their wives to cultivate land that they use with the loans from their wives. Then that story looks very different. That story of capitalism, that story of the expansion of slavery looks very different. It looks like a story that where women should be a fundamental part of it. And so I was simply speculating about that in the book here because I needed to kind of lay the groundwork for a broader discussion about that. But I think it's really important to think about the ways in which men relied upon women's wealth for their livelihoods. And, and when women were the only slave owners, women were the only property owners, that, prop, that ownership became a bone of contention, a bone of conflict. Um, there were some women who, for example, um, refused to marry a man <laughs> if they did not sign what would, would be the equivalent of a prenup today. Because they understood that these men were gold diggers. They were seeking their wealth and they were gonna do whatever they wanted with it because they thought coverture, you know, covered all bases. Um, but these women were savvy. They were astute. They knew the consequences of marriage for them and they wanted to protect themselves. Sometimes they did that, they, they protected themselves in collaboration with family members, but in other cases, they, they were at the helm of that. They, they were the ones that said, I need to ensure that these men, this man <laughs> will not get his hands on my money or my slaves and squander them away. Um, and so it's really interesting to see how slavery becomes fundamental to the ways in which the, the order of certain households unfolds um, is, is organized in the first place. More questions? Yes, sir. So the equity court you mentioned, mm -hmm. if that uh, decision is conflicting with other courts, mm -hmm. how are those resolved? So most often these women don't even bother going to common law courts. They go right to the equity courts in large part because equity courts, I'll say very briefly, in England and then here in the United States, equity courts were courts that were um, developed to remedy, to provide remedy to those individuals who could not seek remedy in regular courts. So these were, um, they operated side by side, but they operated for very different reasons and they often operated for the dispossessed, those who were wronged, usually women, the poor, um, the laboring classes, et cetera. So women knew that if they, wanted, if they wanted a remedy, if they wanted to win, though that was where they would go because they couldn't find remedy, they couldn't find um, recompense and justice in common law courts. So they went to equity courts first and usually only went to equity courts. Questions, yes. I'm assuming that after uh, it became illegal to bring African foot people into this country for slavery, that the increase in agriculture across as the country expanded and the need for more slaves was there and, and we've read about the male slave owners, both themselves and, and breeding people, do I assume to it to be a fact that women did no less or encourage the same thing? You are correct. So when I was um, referring to um, sexual violence and referring to um, the ways, the different ways that um, white women um, dealt with um, mixed race um, children, whether they be the consequences of sexual assault or the, of, of, of their own coercive sexual relations or the sexual assault perpetrated by their husbands or family members. Um, I was also um, going to talk about that, but I didn't want to go on um, much longer. But yes, what I, what I was able to discover by, again, paying attention to what formerly enslaved people had to say about the question of sexual violence is that they, they did indeed implicate white women, not simply in complicity, 
but also in creating the circumstances that made sexual violence possible, whether that be, for example, um, um, an enslaved woman went to her mistress to say, you know, the overseer is trying to have sex with me. He's trying to assault me. I, I, I keep fighting him off and he keeps coming back. And she said, well, wh what are you doing standing here? Why don't you go, go give yourself to him? And so she continued to fight him. She, that mistress said, why are you continuing to fight him? Beat her, and as a consequence of that, she relinquished. She, she, she relinquished control. She relinquished resistance. She refused to resist anymore. And she ended up being sexually assaulted by the overseer and had children. But there were other women who, this woman, for example, Emily Haiti, who she would um, force enslaved people to have sex with each other, um, with people of, that weren't of their choosing. And when those um, couplings um, produced children, she would sell the boys and keep the girls and start the process all over again. So there were instances in which enslaved people certainly um, make the argument that white women um, sought the economic benefits of sexual violence and created circumstances that made that violence possible in the first place. The law resolved that. So the law said that wh whoever owned the woman owned the child. I, I just wanted to, to highlight that as actually another um, example of the kind of contribution that um, Steph's book makes. You know, I, we, or I, I tried to talk before about how this kind of big idea of coverture gets broken down you know, through the methods of social history and a canny use of sources. You could say the same thing about the idea of partis sequitur ventrum, right, which is you know, this, this idea that means that um, you know, um, the child follows the condition of the mother. Right? So this is very important to say Frederick Douglass's narrative and, and general ideas um, about breeding and a natural increase after the end of the slave trade. Um, but um, as you show, you know, um, it, it's actually not the case that um, you know, um, the other side of the equation, where it's not a, um, a, ma a white master and an enslaved um, black woman you know, a, as a couple, but instead the white slave-owning woman and the, the African-American male slave, that those get, we know from like, the work of Martha Hodes you know, like, of the existence of those relationships, but as a property arrangement, in, in, and as a property arrangement that, that's like, much more complex than the historical legal abstraction of partis, vetris, um, partis equator of ventrum could lead us to believe. Like, that's very powerful, I think, to, to kind of get at the complexity um, of those kinds of situations. Other questions, please. This, in some ways, isn't a question, because I don't think you're going to be able to answer. But as you've been speaking, you, I'm Canadian. And you're reminding me of a current situation that's changing, but nannies. In Canada, it's considered a very desirable place to be able to come, because you can get citizenship through being a nanny. But people came, um, they had to leave their children behind, and it was only after they became citizens. That's changing now. Many of the people were from the Caribbean at a certain point, and that's how Caribbean immigrants started. Then they would bring their families over. So I think there's a lot to reflect on. Now it's people from the Philippines. So how this situation in some ways goes forward and, and hasn't ended and how women are often the controlling force in those situations in terms of, uh, of being the, employees who s the employers who set the uh, terms of, of employment. And thank you for that comment because it, um, it connects to the conversation or the, the element of the conversation um, related to enslaved wet nurses. So one of the things that became clear in the advertisements that I looked at was that many of these women, and some of the advertisements um, reflected that as well, that, that many of these women were separated from their children in order to, pr to provide this labor. So they were, um, there were some ads where it would say, where, they would, where the person um, posting, or the, the person who in, um, submitted the ad would say, um, uh, wet nurse, black wet nurse wanted without children. Black wet nurse wanted without encumbrance. Um, or they would be offered wet nurse without children um, or just lost her child. And so there is a way in which um, these women are demanding the, very, the separation of these women from their children at those really, um, now we know, those really um, vulnerable moments, those really important and critical moments in the child's development um, so that they could serve in that capacity to their own children. 
Um, so there's a way in which I think there is a perpetuation of this kind of um, the commodification of maternal labor, but also there's a maternal violence that's involved in that process as well. And so um, I see this, that process that I talk about, that I just talked about, as a form of a maternal violence that white women don't perform against their own or, or perpetrate against their own children, but perpetrate against enslaved women and enslaved children. We're close to 1.30. Any, what's, anyone like to, oh, yes, please, let's go ahead. Um, could you talk a little bit about class differences among slave-owning women? You know, like different richness of different families? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, as I mentioned, um, what I wanted to try to do is to, to, to delve more deeply into the worlds of the average, the typical slave-owning woman, because much of the scholarship on white Southern women has largely relied upon the diaries and the letters of a very small subset of the most elite and also highly literate slaveholding population. Um, and so what it means is that if we, if we rely on those, and Brian got at this um, in his comments, if we rely upon those documents, we're going to get a very particular picture of slavery and one, a particular picture of women's economic investments in the institution of slavery. Um, many of the women that I talk about in this book were not literate. They either couldn't read or they couldn't write or they couldn't do both. And so they didn't leave records behind. Um, and so for me, it was really important um, to, to highlight their experiences, to try to get at their experiences, because this is an experience that we don't often um, learn about. Um, and so, um, what I did see um, in the testimonies of formerly enslaved people um, are these class differences. Um, sometimes, um, and, and I think this is where the hiring market comes into play, so there's a way in which um, slave, some slave-owning women had so many enslaved people that they didn't need them all, and so they would hire them out to women who either didn't own their own slaves so that they could use them in you know, their own businesses, for example, boarding house operations or um, groceries, or et cetera, or that they would supplement um, a very small slaveholding that they had. Um, and so um, what, what was really interesting is that these class differences really came to the fore um, around issues of violence. Um, there's one particular case that I talk about in the book where um, an ins a slave-owning woman hires out an enslaved girl to another white woman, and that white woman, um, because this enslaved girl is in her, um, in her possession, she treats her as, she, as if she is her own, even though she's simply hiring her out, and she, she brutally attacks the, the young girl. And so it is in, that, in that, um, that assumption of ownership, that assumption of power over this enslaved girl that the elite white woman who hires her out um, reasserts her power and reasserts her power and as, um, uh, um, enunciates or re um, reiterates um, her class distinction between herself and the woman who's hiring um, her out. So there's a way in which violence um, and the, the hiring, the process of hiring enslaved people and the circulation of enslaved people through the hiring market really um, brings, to, brings those class divisions um, to light in a way that I think they're often diminished in um, much of the scholarship that we read um, about. Let's show our appreciation, please, for Steph and Leslie and Brian. <laughs> and of course, buy the book. <laughs> Thank you all very much. <laughs>